This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Church Street United Methodist Church proudly presents Rejoice. Good morning and welcome to Rejoice. I'm Richard Looney, one of the pastors of Church Street United Methodist Church, and I welcome you to this time of thought and worship. As we prepare for our time together, please listen to the choir as they sing, There is a land of pure delight, then we will follow with the reading of the scripture. The scripture lesson for today comes from the fifth chapter of Matthew, this wonderful section of the Sermon on the Mount. You'll remember that uh, last week we looked at the, the Beatitudes. And Jesus said, if you want to be happy, if you want to be blessed, remember to be poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, etc. And then Jesus moves to describe those of us who are to be followers as salt and light. Hear these words, the 13th through the 16th verses. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste or its saltiness, how can its saltiness be restored? 
It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Then Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. When you think about that, that's an incredible responsibility and an incredible privilege to live so as to be salt and to live so as to be light. All of us know the expression that somebody is the salt of the earth, and we, re we mean that as a high compliment. It means that they are unadulterated in their goodness. They are sincere in their life, their belief, and their practice. And all of us are, as followers of Christ, supposed to be salt to bring zest, to bring life, and to be a preservative in the world. Salt was very prized in that day because it was a preservative because it was seen as pure, the whiteness of it, and because it brought zest to our eating and our taste. So let's think about these ways that we who follow Christ are supposed to be salt for our time. Salt was called the purest of things because it came from the sun and the sea. The sun would dry out the water so that salt remained. So we are to be examples of purity and whiteness in our life and in our influence. Our world needs that today. We've been so uh, tend to compromise and so eager to fit in that almost anything is legitimate. But as Paul described it, we are to be pure and blameless as followers of Christ. Nowadays, you don't know whether people are speaking the truth or not. They exaggerate. They make extravagant claims. They spin uh, all kinds of theories that have no basis in reality. And we will say almost anything about somebody we disagree with to make a point. But we aren't free to do that as followers of Christ. We are to speak the truth in love. And the truth we discover uh, in Christ. It's easy nowadays to assume that because we work for a large church or a large company that we can get by with whatever we please. But we are called to be conscientious. We are called to give due reward for our time due diligence for our time. In an earlier appointment, I had a young man who was very religious. He was uh, very critical of people that didn't live up to his standards. And yet he used to brag about how he would slip off at work and find a corner to hide and read his Bible and do his prayer time, thinking that this was uh, pious and, and godly. But actually, it was very ungodly because he was stealing time from his employer that he was pledged to work for and give due diligence for his time and effort. We can't be slackers. Uh, we can't uh, fall down on the job because we are called to be salt. We are called to be pure. Salt was also seen as a preservative. It kept things from going bad. I remember as a boy growing up on a mountain farm, and each fall we uh, killed hogs. We didn't have freezers. Uh, we had a small refrigerator. But we wanted to preserve the hams and the shoulders and the ribs. And the way you did it was by coating them with salt. And I can still p picture in our smokehouse these hams on a, on a board hanging down from the ceiling to keep them away from rats, covered with salt. 
And you remember how country ham was always very salty. So uh, we are to be a preservative in society. Society may uh, take liberty with the truth. Society may be willing to compromise and, and use bad language. Society may be willing to tell off-color stories. But we are followers of, of Christ, and we are expected to be salt. Not through our haranguing, but through our quiet influence. We are to make clear that we stand for what's right, for what will preserve. And sometimes a good influence can have a profound effect on human life. Somebody said that there are some folks in whose presence it's easy to compromise, but in other folks' presence it's easy to do what is right. And each one of us should preserve the good and the true and the right in our life, in our speech, in our work, and in our attitudes. We are to be a preservative in a society that can go rotten, that can go stale. But primarily, salt was used to bring zest or taste to a dish or to life. Uh, sometimes we get the idea that we Christians are supposed to spread gloom wherever we go, that we're supposed to be negative voices, don't do this and don't do that. We're to be the condemners in the world. But if you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus brought a zest to life. People enjoyed being with Jesus. They sought his company. He was fun to be with because he talked about joy. He talked about the love and goodness of God. And he talked about how life can be full of blessedness and full of meaning. So it's important that uh, we bring zest to life. Uh, think about somebody that you like to be around. Are they gloomy? Are they condemning? No, you find in them somebody who's full of affirmation, somebody who's full of joy, somebody who's uh, expectant about the future and confident about the goodness of God. It's interesting that Jesus said, if salt loses its taste, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot. In other words, salt becomes just like sand. You use it to pave a walkway. And we too are to keep our zest or we become useless. Jesus had a great deal to say about becoming useless. He talked about a fig tree that had no fruit. He talked about branches that bore no fruit. And he said they're worth only being cut off and piled up and burned. And if we bring no zest to life, if we bring no purpose and joy to life, you know, we're useless as followers of Christ. We may be punctual in our attendance. We may study the good book. We may seek to follow the Ten Commandments. But if we do so with a kind of heaviness, then we take the joy and the zest out of life. We need to bring joy to life. And then in a, a wonderful way, Jesus said, you're not only salt, you're not only to preserve, you're not only to be pure, you're not only to bring zest, but you are to be useful. And those who are most useful are those who are most zestful. And then Jesus said, you are to be light for the world. You don't uh, light a candle and then put a bushel over it. You don't try to hide it, but you let it shine. You place it on a place where it can be seen. The beautiful thing about this is that Jesus himself said he was light for the world. And you remember how we understand that? He helps us get out of darkness. He said, if you follow me, you will walk in the light and you will become light. Well, Jesus destroyed our darkness about the meaning of God and the character of God. He taught us that God is a Father. 
that God is a seeking shepherd who wants to find us and enrich our life and lead us in right paths. He uh, said that God is not reluctant. God is eager to bless our life. And we are to reflect that same attitude in our sharing of our faith. God is not a God who has to be placated by sacrifice. God is not a stingy God who has to be begged. Uh, God is not a condemning God. God is a God who seeks to enrich life and to guide our life. And as disciples of the light, we are to bring that same attitude in our talking of God and in our sharing of our faith. Uh, Jesus also taught us to know who our brother, our neighbor is. Our neighbor is anyone who has a need. Our neighbor is anyone whose path we cross that we can help. And there's some people we may not like. There's some people we may not appreciate. But these are God's children. These are our brothers and sisters. And this understanding is to be reflected in the way we treat people. And in a wonderful way, God shows us the truth about ourselves. We aren't just a little clod of uh, wishes and desires, but we are children of God. We are given a unique and special dignity. We are to treat ourselves with, with respect. And then Jesus showed us how we are to live, not for ourselves, but for others not selfishly, but unselfishly, always looking to discover God's will in our life and in our work. So we find in him our light, and then we are to be light. There's a fascinating expression in this. It said, let your light shine. It didn't say, make your light shine. And this helps us understand that light is a reflection it's a reflection of the light we find in Christ. I don't know about you, but uh, I am amused and uh, turned off by people who assume a certain kind of re 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 <laughs> religiousness. <laughs> I have a tongue twister there for a minute. But we don't assume a certain kind of holiness you, you remember somebody who always seems to have a holy smile? You know, it's sort of faked and it's not really who they are. And sometimes we preachers assume a holy tone of voice. I remember one of my good friends was a real man's man. But when he prayed, he became somebody else. I can still hear him say, Oh, God, to, our God, to, how holy is thy name. And you want to say, Who is that? I don't know that fellow. I'm not acquainted with him. Uh, we are not to assume a certain kind of righteousness. We are to be a certain kind of righteousness. And it comes as a reflection of our life in Christ. So I'd invite all of us to know that we can shine. Uh, sometimes the way we live, we ought to put a bushel on our light because it's a, a false light in an unhelpful light. But we should reflect in our own life the goodness of Christ, the joy of Christ, the wonder of the faith. So let your light shine. Now, if this is to happen, we will need to stay close to the source of our light, will we not? It's a reflection of his life. So we need to know who his life, what his life was like, who Christ is. That's why the church always talks about the beans of grace, the ways by which God reaches us. And these means are found in study of the scripture and really asking what does this mean and how would this be lived out in my life? We need to know who Christ is. And sometimes we will realize immediately that this does not reflect the Spirit of Christ. My judgmental attitude, my self-centeredness, my negative thought in life, 
does not reflect who Jesus is. Sometimes uh, we get upset with the preacher for saying something that we think the preacher shouldn't say. But sometimes what he's saying or she is saying is a reflection of the teaching of Christ. And we should not turn aside something because we don't like it, but we need to wrestle with it and see what it means in our own life, in our own ministry. Not only do we read the scriptures, but we come together to worship. So often in worship, we get a new insight through the sermon or through the, the anthem. We get support and strength for those others who are gathered. And we can reflect a new kind of life as, as we worship regularly, knowing that we go from worship into the world to be witnesses, to be lights for others. So it's important that we worship, and a part of worship, of course, is the observance of the sacraments. Every time a baby is baptized or an adult is baptized, we remember that Christ makes it possible for us to be cleansed from our sin and self-centeredness. Every time we go to the table to share in the Lord's Supper, we remember the broken body and shed blood of our Lord, and we're moved to reverence Him and worship Him and follow Him with a new dignity. And then in a special way, we reflect the Spirit of Christ as we reach out to serve others. Every Thursday at Church Street, dozens of people gather to prepare a meal for the homeless or those who are less fortunate. And it's been amazing to me to watch the way this is done with care and with love, it's always a good meal. People are treated courteously. And we discover in these children of God who have fallen on unfortunate circumstances, we discover not only a brother or sister, but we discover that Christ is near to us when we reach out to serve others. And then in a wonderful way, we reflect the Spirit of Christ through our generosity, through the giving of our means, through the sharing of our tithes and offerings. And sometimes people find a new relationship to God when they become generous, when they reach out and reach into their pocket and give more than they intended, because God is a generous God and we find God near in our generosity. So Jesus said, uh, I am the light of the world, but in an amazing sense, you too are the light of the world. You can reflect the character of God. You can reflect the Spirit of Christ, and you can be a light for somebody who walks in darkness. Just recently, I asked a fellow in a, in a restaurant, how long have you worked here? And he said, uh, two days. And I said, well, you act like you know what you're doing. He said, well, I've done this before, but I got in trouble, and I'm trying to set things right. And in just simple inquiry of how are you or how long have you worked here, I had the opportunity to wish this person well, and I hope to be a blessing, as I said to them, may God bless you and strengthen you in your effort. Isn't it wonderful to be entrusted, to bring, bring zest to life, to bring light to darkness? Don't hide your light under a bushel. Don't allow your salt to become tasteless, but in the power and wonder of God, be useful in God's service. And as we think about salt and light, listen to Karen Cook as she sings, bread of angels, and may we all be bread for the world in the name of Christ.
God bless you and thank you for joining the program Rejoice today. As you have opportunity, you would be welcome at any of our services at Church Street each Sunday morning at 8.30 and at 11 in the nave, and then in the chapel on Wednesdays at noon. We would be happy for you to join us, and if you can't, uh, remember our services and your prayers. Remember again the great honor that Jesus has bestowed upon his followers to be salt and to be light. May you in your attitudes and in your actions and in your relationships this week bring joy and zest to somebody's life. And may you be God's light to open a window, to open a door for somebody's understanding of God's goodness. Go in peace for Christ's sake. Members and friends of Church Street United Methodist Church, your downtown church at the corner of Henley and Main, would like to thank you for joining Rejoice. Please send us your comments and suggestions, and be sure to tune in next Sunday at this same time for Rejoice. <laughs>